Welcome. Today we are doing a bit of a heavy topic, which is S3. It's a big one. So buckle in. We're going to be diving into this one. Maybe take some notes. I would recommend it. S3 is a very important part of AWS and we are having a look. So let's get into it. What is S3? Great question. S3 stands for Simple Storage Service. I'm going to say it again, simple storage service, this guy. And you can think of it as kind of like cloud storage, similar to Google Drive, but more for businesses. So it can handle infrastructure, maintenance, security, all of that good stuff so that you can just store what you need to store. It's a serverless service, which means that it will automatically scale up and down depending on what you need. And it can store unlimited data in all sorts of different formats accessible from anywhere in the world. Wild. So how does S3 actually work? Well, you can see in here that we have a bucket and that bucket has a name. Now with S3, we store all of our data in these buckets. In each bucket, you can always see the logs of who has accessed it and who has access to its content. And you can add permissions to it so you can lock it down so that no one can see it or perhaps remove or add items to the bucket. You can create permissions around that. And then you also need to choose a geographical place where your bucket is actually going to be where you can access that data. So in here, you can see that we have our bucket. It's got a little location tag. It's got a lock on it for our security. It's got all of the different things that we're going to be chucking in that bucket. But it's also got a very unique name. Now, the name of the bucket always needs to be distinctive and something that hasn't been used before. Each AWS account allows you to set up 100 buckets. And once you've created your bucket and you've selected the region of your bucket, you cannot change that region. Also, if you end up putting more than 100,000 different objects into your bucket, then you can't remove it using the S3 console. Even worse, if versioning is turned on, then you can't remove the S3 bucket through the AWS command line interface. Now, these all might seem like, whoa, what are we even talking about here? What do these mean? But they'll all become clear. The main thing is that if you fill up your bucket too much, it becomes very difficult to remove. Wherever you decide to put your bucket initially, geographically, that's where it stays. It's got to have a unique name and you can set your permissions on it to who can access, edit, or even view the data that's in your bucket. Now your bucket can do all sorts of cool things aside from just store data. It can actually even host a static website, which is very cool. Now we can access all of the objects that are within our bucket by using keys, and that's how we can identify each object or file or whatever it is that you want to store in there with that unique key. So within S3, we also have a bunch of different storage classes. So you think that S3 is just this great bucket, but actually no, it's like having all these buckets in different colors and shapes and sizes, and you've got to work out which one is best for you. So let's have a look at all the different storage classes that are in Amazon S3. Starting with S3 standard, it seems like a good place to start. <laughs> so S3 standard is for your frequently accessed data, like things you are accessing more than once a month with millisecond access. A great example is things that might go up on a website, videos or photos that you want to put on your website, data analytics, maybe even a few lightweight backups. Next is standard IA. A standard IA is for infrequently accessed data. These are things that you are accessing no more than once a month, I would say. More for backup and disaster recovery type thing. Number three, is one zone IA. This is data that can be recreated if it's lost, but it's accessed way less frequently. Again, millisecond access here. So very, very fast, same as the other two. This is for your secondary backups, your copies of copies, easily recreatable data. Number four is intelligent tiering. This is for data with unknown or changing access patterns because it will move data between different tiers depending on how often it is accessed. How cool is that? <laughs> for example, if you have YouTube and all the videos on YouTube, they have different access depending on how popular the video is. So if one video is only getting, you know, a view a day or a view a week or a view a month compared to a video that's getting millions of views in hours, then they're going to have different types of storage because 
one of them needs to handle way, way more than the other. And this is where intelligent tearing comes in handy. Next, we have Glacier Instant Retrieval. This is for your long-term archive data that is accessed maybe once a quarter and you still need to get it within like milliseconds. This is the lowest cost storage option for your long-lived data. This might be good for situations where you need to access this sort of data quite quickly, but not very often. So maybe analysis, compliance, or other business-related purposes. Then we have Glacier Flexible Retrieval, which used to be just S3 Glacier, and this is for your much longer-term backups. So with Flexible Retrieval, you can only access these really, you should be planning for once a year. And the retrieval time, instead of it being milliseconds, it's now minutes or even hours. This is good for your backup and disaster recovery, where it doesn't really matter so much about the cost, but you need that backup <laughs> and you're okay with it being retrieved in minutes. Last, we have the Glacier Deep Archive, which you're thinking, I thought we'd already got there. I thought that was the biggest, most longest one that we just did. But no, it gets even deeper. This is the real long-term one. Again, maybe accessing it once a year, once or twice a year, but it's got a retrieval time of 12 hours. So this one is going to be cheaper, but you really can't expect to get anything back in a hurry. It's for digital preservation, historical records, that sort of thing where you need to keep it, but you're really not going to need to access it that much. So that's all the different types of storage classes that we have. Let's talk a little bit about the features of S3, starting with access management and security, a very important one. S3 buckets and objects are private by default, but there are lots of tools and features that help to enable its security. These include S3 block public access, IAM, which we've talked about in previous videos, bucket policies, S3 endpoints, and so much more. Next up is Amazon S3 versioning. Versioning just means that you're helping to keep track of the changes that have been made. So you might have multiple different versions of something so that you can look back and see, oh, that's where we started and then we made these changes and now it was in version two. And then we made these changes and now it's in version three so that you can actually keep track of when these changes were made, who made them, whether they were good or not. And you can always revert back to previous versions if something isn't working. It's really good for safeguarding against accidental changes and deletions, as you can imagine. And you can always retrieve those older versions if you really need to. Next is the S3 static website. This is simply for hosting static websites on Amazon S3. It's a really easy, cost-effective way for simple websites to be hosted. Then we have S3 replication, which is about automatically copying files from one bucket to another bucket. This is great for your backups of your buckets in case of damage or file loss or something goes wrong, something gets deleted or, or overrun or whatever it is, then at least you have a backup that you've made using replication. Then S3 encryption, which is all about security, encrypting things. Encryption is really useful for data when it's in transit, which is when it's been sent somewhere. So it's going across the internet, which is a wild place, by the way, it could constantly be attacked. It's like going down a highway where there's all these like people that are just trying to rob your car. So it's useful for that, but it's also useful for at its destinations either of where it needs to go or where it started from, it keeps your data safe there. So whether it's on the move or whether it's where it, the end destination is or the start destination, uh, it's going to help with both of those places. Then we have S3 transfer acceleration, which is about speeding up your file uploads and your file downloads. This is great for very long distance transfer of large files and enhancing your data transfer speed. To summarize everything that we've talked about today with S3, the best S3 option really depends on your storage patterns and how often you are accessing that data. The options include standard S3, S3 intelligent tiering, S3 one zone IA, Glacier storage, both instant and flexible, and the Glacier Deep Archive. S3 is a huge topic. We've only just kind of glossed over the very high level things. But the best way to learn is to get in there and actually start looking at some stuff. So I hope this was a good overview to whet your appetite and get you started. And all the best. We'll see you in the next video.